We're back. This is Dear World Christian, the podcast. And my name is Jason. Thank you so much for stopping by. We talk about racism and racists a lot here on this channel. We discuss whether or not somebody has a view that they are genetically superior to another person or if a people group is genetically superior to another people group or anything of that nature. We, we kind of discuss that quite a bit. And I want to make sure that we today look at another example of when somebody maybe displays a true racist superiority, partiality mindset. Does that infect everybody who's ever around that person? Does that mean everybody who's ever affirmed that person or approves of that person's other projects is racist or has demonstrated partiality? I think we should look at that. So something I'm going to ask, if you stay to the end of the video, we'll answer this question. Do you want God to look at you as a snapshot of one bad activity? Or would you rather God look at you in the whole of all the good things that you've tried to do in your life? You're, you're trying to do good things. Which one would you rather God look at you at? Snapshot of your bad, your bad activities or your bad um, doings or the whole of you trying to do right? At the end of the video, we'll discuss that in a second. Into this. And before we go any further, let us go ahead and talk about what is the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ came to save people who are trying to do the best. No, that's not right. Jesus Christ came into this world to save people who are trying. No, not that either. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Every last one of us is a sinner. We have offended God by our words, our deeds, our actions, and our thoughts. We've rebelled against his holy, just, and righteous word, and we deserve full punishment. But God, in his grace, in his gracious kindness has sent Christ to live the perfect life that we could not live, to die the perfect sacrifice, to die as the perfect sacrifice that we could never be, and to now sit at the right hand of the Father as our perfect mediator. So in Christ, all of your sins, every last one of them, even the one that you don't think anybody knows about, is dealt with in Christ. And he can be your perfect mediator and your perfect sacrifice because he lived a perfect life. So the gospel, Christ came to save sinners. And that's too you. far gone. I also want to point out something so, else. We're going to be talking about racism. We're going to be talking about how we want God to look at us. And we're going to look at what happens when you realize that somebody that maybe you esteemed was a bad actor. Maybe somebody that you looked up to was doing something wrong or did actually demonstrate partiality. And can you separate yourself from them? Can Are you allowed to say, yeah, that person said that here and right there, that snippet, I don't support that snippet. But everything else that they've done, I do support those things. They, they were they were fruitful and beneficial in this area, but this area right here, no, we cannot deal with them. And, and you call it out directly and say that it was bad, say that they were wrong in that. Is that enough? So that's what I want you to think about as we get ready to watch this video. So let's jump in. Get off with the first one. Um, as we celebrate 500 years from when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses upon the Wittenberg Cathedral doors, we are undoubtedly speaking highly of men like Luther, Calvin, Bucer, Zwingli, and the truths they heralded and established. However, inevitably, conversation comes up about, for instance, Luther's anti-Semitic writings or Calvin's involvement in the death of Servetus. So the question is this, how should we consider these men who were so monumentally used by God for great good, and yet we see either glaring flaws or blind spots in their lives, how should we see them, feel about them, if we find genuinely troubling truths about their personal lives, or even perhaps a doctrinal stance they may have held? All right, so before Phil jumps in, I want to just say he's going to talk about several examples, but let's just compact that. We know that Martin Luther wrote some very non-favorable things about Jews. Yep, that's true. We also know that John Calvin was involved in some way, shape, or form with the execution of surveillance. We know that to be true. He's going to talk about some other people as well. We know these to be true. So can we, do we look at the person in regards to all of their life, or do we look at them in light of this segment or this the small snapshot if you will of their lives so i want you to think about that as we move forward uh, my answer to that is the same answer i would give if you asked 
about the list of heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11. Okay. You read that list in Hebrews 11, and it includes men like Samson, who uh, in so many ways was a spiritual disaster. He uh, was dedicated by his parents at a very young age, you know, to be, to live the lifelong role of a Nazarite, which meant that he couldn't cut his hair, he couldn't, he wasn't supposed to touch wine or any of the fruit of the vine, and he wasn't supposed to touch dead bodies. He did all those things. And, uh, you know, he ate the honey out of the corpse of a lion and then boasted about it and uh, just lived a profligate life and, and uh, dishonored his parents because he wanted to marry a Philistine girl and they were appalled by that, that idea. Uh, so he married a pagan girl and he, he was, uh, that got him into a fight with her in-laws in which he had to kill a bunch of them. You look at his life in terms of you know, 21st century moral standards, and you say this man was a disaster. He was an absolute disaster, and yet Scripture lists him as one of the heroes of the faith. Uh, and the I think that's something we have to think about. We like to romanticize history and say, "Oh, this was great," and "No, oh, this is bad." Um, but no, I mean, Samson, as, as he said, like, he was a spiritual disaster, and he is still included in the household, or rather, the hall of faith. So I think we have to be mindful of that. Like, wait. He had some terrible shortcomings and flaws. He's still included in the house of faith. Continue. The answer is we're all flawed. Some of us are flawed more than others, but all men are flawed, and God has always used flawed men. David committed adultery and murder. Phil Johnson said God has always used flawed men. I'm just going to go here and say God only uses flawed men because we're all flawed. And those are sins which admittedly would disqualify a man from leading the church today. If I knew that was, uh, if I knew someone who wanted to be a pastor and he had committed adultery and, you know, arranged for the death of his uh, paramour's r legitimate husband, I would say there's no way that man can ever be above reproach. He, he cannot, uh, even if he's repented afterwards, I wouldn't want to see him in a pastoral role, role because he's not above reproach, and that's the first requirement for a pastor. And yet, uh, the Lord kept him as king of Israel, and uh, he he is the one from whom the messianic line uh, descended. So the Lord can overrule his own, uh, I mean, he he justifies the ungodly, right? Uh, it's I think that's something we certainly should just take a second and unpack. God justifies the ungodly. And we have to be mindful that we are the ungodly. As much as we want to spruce ourselves up and make ourselves look good and, and such of that nature, we are the ungodly. We are not perfect. We are by no means perfect. We're by no means in right standing before God on our own. We have to be mindful of that and just say it and believe it and understand it. I'm ungodly. I'm ungodly apart from Christ. But let's get, give him room to spin it out. It's not that he throws out justice and it's not that he throws out morality. Be sure your sin will find you out. And in all those cases, it does. But the fact that men have flaws doesn't mean God can't use them. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't honor them for their faith and their faithfulness where they were faithful. I think Calvin's flaws are often grossly exaggerated. He didn't, he didn't personally kill Servetus. He simply said, you know, by the laws of the time, it, it, what, what Servetus did, teaching heresy and sedition and uh, anarchy, he was an anarchist, uh, was worthy of the death penalty by the civil laws of the time. And Calvin actually pleaded for a more merciful form of execution than burning him at the stake. And it was the city council who said, no, we're going to burn him at the stake. So Calvin in that, I think, is often portrayed as a murderer and a bloodthirsty man when he was not. If you know Calvin's character and read his sermons and all that, you find he's a much better man than either Catholics or Arminians want to admit. Uh, it's true that Luther became anti-Semitic. He didn't start out that way, uh, but as time went by... Hey, let me, let me unpack that for a second. So John Calvin tends to get a bad rap because of what happened with Servetus, 
And again, that's a snapshot. That's a snapshot of a situation in the whole of this man's life. Now we're going to talk about Martin Luther again at the end of his life. How do we deal with these men when they have a snapshot of something that happens in their lives, maybe five, 10 years of it, of the whole of their lives? Do we just throw them all away? What do we do? He became frustrated. He, he believed that when once the gospel was clarified and and he had dug out the, the doctrine of justification by faith from under centuries of Roman Catholic tradition, he believed that the Jewish people, when they heard the gospel, would respond. And when they didn't, he grew frustrated and uh, wrote some pretty harshly anti-Semitic material. Uh, and there's no excuse for that. There's no way to say, well, that wasn't really so bad. It was, it was bad, and there were other things Luther did that were bad. He had a, he had a vile mouth. Uh, Notice that Phil is not sugarcoating. He said that what he did was bad. What he did was wrong. But I mean, he's, he's not sugarcoating. He's not saying that Martin was Luther was some kind of saint without error, without any sin. He's saying that he did he did do things wrong. And he's even going to expound on some more. You know, he um, now everything Luther said, even privately, was taken down by students of his and published posthumously in a collection called Table Talk. And you'll find most of the outrageous things uh, Luther said you'll find in his table talk, not in his commentaries or his thoughtful writings. So in a way, it's not fair uh, to Luther to, to think that things he meant to be in private discourse, things he, where he might have been joking even, things he didn't write himself, other people took it down. And if you've ever had other people take down your words and tweet them, they never get it exactly right either. And uh, whatever you say that sounds bad is going to be exaggerated by the people who record it. So you, ha you do have to cut Luther a little slack on that. But there's no question he was a flawed man. And uh, so ask yourself, is Phil excusing um, Martin Luther for his bad, um, for his flaws? Is he excusing his flaws? I think we can all agree. No, Mr. Johnson is not excusing Luther's flaws. He's actually extenuating them and actually giving context to quite a bit of them, but he's not excusing them. Maybe he was joking around the table. Okay. I think he makes it kind of clear that, Hey, sometimes that, that goes South and we know that to be true in this modern day age. So he's not ex at all excusing bad behavior. He's just giving it in proper context. Some of the reformers had pretty severe short-sighted flaws, uh, but we honor them nevertheless for their faith and their faithfulness while we recognize their flaws and say, you know, there's no way to justify that. One of my favorite. Okay, before he goes into that, he makes it extremely clear. I think he's he's done a great job of saying, hey, you can be faithful to God and flawed. And we could say, man, you had a great faith. You are, you are a phenomenal preacher or exegete. You wrote fantastic books, but man, you were jacked up in this area. I think we can see that. And I believe scripture supports that idea with David and Samson are the two examples that he gives. We see that. That's a very consistent with scripture that we acknowledge, yes, that, hey, you are you are fantastic in the faith. You are faithful to God till the end. Wonderful, great, wonderful. However, you are still flawed. There's no way around that. Nobody's excusing that. Nobody's um, trying to sweep that under the rug. So here he goes. This is Phil's situation. And let's hear what Phil has to say about that. Theologians uh, in America is R.L. Dabney. Dabney. He, was, he was a Presbyterian theologian. And I firmly believe that he would be remembered as America's greatest theologian ever, except that he got embroiled in the Civil War. He was a Southern Presbyterian. During the time of the Civil War, he was the, the chaplain to uh, Stonewall Jackson. So he was actually in the military and fought uh, for the South in the war. And so before he goes any further, is he at all excusing and saying or, or minimizing Dabney's involvement in the Civil War? No, he says like the reason he's not even considered the greatest theologian is because of this. The reason he's um, maybe even the reason Phil is even having to talk about him is because of his involvement in the Civil War and his being a chaplain to Stonewall Jackson and fighting for the Southern Confederate States during the Civil War. So he's not at all excusing any of that. And when the South lost, he became embittered and never really got over it. And some of his later writings also are racist, you know, just racist. 
Okay, ask yourself, did Phil just say that R.L. Dabney, the person that he thinks is probably one of the best or greatest theologians in the Americas, was writing racist, racist writings? Did he just say that? He did. He said that out of his own mouth. And so much so that when uh, the Banner of Truth published his collected writings on essays and stuff like that, it's called Discussions. It's actually my favorite set of books. Of all the books on my shelf, that's the one I would least like to, to lose because there's some just brilliant material in there. But when Banner of Truth, it was originally four volumes, and when Banner of Truth picked it up and published it, they made it three volumes because they took out, there was so much racist material at the end that they had to take out. So they deleted half of volume three and most of volume four and put it in three volumes. Uh, and I look at Dabney and I think, what a shame. What a shame. I mean, he was a product of his times. Okay, so is he, oh, here it comes. Is Phil, I want you to ask yourself the question, is Phil celebrating Dabney? Is Phil giving Dabney a pass? Is Phil excusing bad behavior? Just listen. Uh and what a shame that he couldn't rise above that and see beyond that because he understood doctrine and loved the scriptures and loved Christ. And I'm sure his level of spiritual maturity was far beyond mine. So uh, I feel bad even criticizing him. But you have to step back and look at that and say he, like, like all those reformers, was a flawed man. And sometimes our flaws outlive uh, and sometimes even overshadow our good qualities. Okay, so did he just say that Dabney was flawed and that his negative situation post-Civil War overshadowed his good theology and love for God and God's word? Did he say that? Because it sure doesn't sound like he's supporting everything that Dabney did. I don't think he did. I don't think he's saying that. Um. You know, it's one of my fears, frankly, because I put a lot of stuff on the Internet. And uh, over the years, some of the things I've written on the Internet have made people angry. And and I hope, you know, succeeding generations don't look and look back and say that the thing that stands out about me is that I was a, you know, sarcastic bad mouther. I recognize I have flaws just like those men. Uh, and it's a shame when our flaws overshadow our Good things, but I don't think that's the case with the reformers. I think the benefits of their ministries really outshine their flaws. The flaws are undeniable, but it's no reason, just because you realize a man has a serious character flaw, isn't necessarily a reason to write off his legacy entirely if he's a man whom God used in a, in a mighty way. And there are lots of biblical examples of that, Samson being the one I, I cited, David being another, there are others. Mm -hmm. uh, who did heinous Every sins, last and yet Scripture commends them for their faith. So we have Phil Johnson explaining why he supported R.L. Dabney. And I just think that it's pretty clear here. Phil is making it very clear. He's drawing a line between pre-Civil War Dabney and post-Civil War Dabney. Pre-Civil War was a strong exegete, believed God's word, trusted God's word, post all of that was overshadowed by his negative opinion of the war and the outcome of the war. I don't see, I don't think that that's, that that has to be a one or the other. If you supported somebody before and you say, well, no, now I'm, I'm better understanding some of the things that they did. So moving forward, I don't rock, I don't support that person, but I did support what they were doing here. That's not inconsistent nor does it make you a racist, nor does it make you a bad person and it's such of that nature. And I don't think we should do that as Christians. Chris Roseboro from Fighting for the Faith called it the poop stink theory. So basically, if one person has a bad idea or philosophy, if anybody around them that supported them or um, believed in them in any way, shape or form, they are also guilty just by association. And that's not the way that we do things. That's not the way. Earlier on, I asked you, do you want God to look at you as a snapshot of one of your bad activities or look at you in the wholeness of your attempts to do the right thing? I'm sorry, I should have given you a third option. 
The third option is, do you want God to look at you in light of what Christ has done, clothed in his righteousness? Well, I believe now you may be changing your answer down in the comment section. No, I don't want God to look at me for any of my bad dealings, not one of them, not one, nor do I want God to look at me for any of my good attempts because both of them, my bad dealings and my attempts to do right are nothing to God. I want him to see me in the righteousness of Christ. So as we're looking at dealing with our brothers and sisters in Christ, whether they're they're grievously flawed or they're just living a flawed life, we have to remember and be mindful of the fact that we want God to deal with us exactly how we're dealing with them. And so that being the case, I'm going to give, I'm going to extend to Phil Johnson, the grace to say, hey, if the man is saying that he is not espousing racial ideas and he hasn't demonstrated that to me, I've not seen it. So therefore, if he supported R.L. Dabney, he's saying that this pre-Civil War R.L. Dabney versus the post-Civil War R.L. Dabney, I'm going to give him the grace because I need that exact same grace in my own life. So as we're dealing with the brothers and sisters in that regard, I'm going to ask you to just consider, how do you want God to deal with you? And how has he dealt with you? I believe that's a great way to look at it. If you want to continue to have this conversation, please feel free to comment down below. There's a couple of videos right here, as well as right here, I believe, that I would love for you to check out as well. And we can continue to have this conversation. Grace and peace. <music>